Never ran anything like it before. And I, without any instruction, I said, take this John Deere tractor with an added grapple and just go use it. I'll be doing other stuff. <laughs> it, but that's what you do with equipment, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you hop on it and you figure it out. Today, we're gonna mill up a trailer load of pine logs. Before we could start working for the day, I had to empty my slab rack and we are actually throwing this on a bonfire around a stump when I normally turn it into firewood. Before we jump into the meat of the video, I want to tell you the first couple shots. I was a little bit out of focus, but it clears up pretty quick for the rest of the video. Hey, it's Brock here with Rock Hill Farms, and I've got the Oakey Woodsman here with me. He owns a sawmill, he does firewood, he fells trees, but he's never ran a Woodland Mills sawmill, and he brought me some pine logs, and I never cut pine. So it's gonna be a learning experience for both of us. Absolutely, I'm excited to run it. All right, first thing we gotta do is get them off the trailer. A little bit more down. Okay, good, good. Good. So Joe brought this trailer load of logs and it's his trailer and it's his logs. And I said, I know two ways to unload these. The first way, is we can go through one at a time and put lifting straps under two spots on each log and loop them over the forks. Or, in about three minutes, I can jam my forks under them, flip them up, and roll them back onto the logs. Awesome. I do this by hand. This is a game changer. It's faster, it's, it's less work, but it might scratch up your trailer. And I gave him the choice because it's his trailer. And he said, just get them off there as quick as you can. Nice. I only mill big logs. I only have big logs. I occasionally do get these smaller ones and I don't know what to do with them. I don't know how to get wood out of them, something that's usable. So how do you approach it, mainly having to deal with logs you can man manhandle? Sure. So uh, most of the time when I'm milling, I am milling for dimensional lumber. Uh, the same stuff, like a two by four, inch and a half by three and a half. And I do that so that way if I'm building a project, I can use sawmilled lumber and store-bought lumber at the same time. Um, that way there's not dimension issues. And then you'll see when I'm milling this, I'm gonna go ahead and take my slabs off. I'm gonna have some of that, those uh, fletches come off and then I'll have some live edge one by boards and then I'll flip it over 180 degrees and do the other side. I like to get two parallel sides and because what I'm after today is six by sixes. So I'm going for a five and a half by a five and a half inch log. Brock normally mills hardwoods. Pine is a little bit different because it's very pitchy. And so you really cannot mill this stuff dry in my experience. Uh, Cause what will happen is the bands just end up getting a very tacky um, film on them. With the hardwoods, I just run them dry. They just cut, it's no, no problem. So what I said about lubricant is, I'm not gonna solve a problem I don't have. The reason I don't have that problem is I'm not milling pine. You start milling pine, you've got to cut it with something. And that's a majority of what I cut with my mill. And when I had those beams soaked in creosote, everyone said that's going to gum up, it's going to ruin your blades, it, it was hard on blades. So I was cutting it with pine saw, thinking that would cut anything. Yeah. But for today, you want water, you want... Dish soap. Dish soap uh, and basically water. Basically dish soap. You almost, in my, how I think about it, is it's almost like you're making something to wash a vehicle. Uh, basically just a little bit of soap just to cut some of it a little bit and add a little, and, and it's also a very small drip on my mill. I don't, do not have to keep a steady stream of water in there. It's almost just a drip. All right, so I've done it a few different ways. If I want this five by five, I've taken a square and drawn lines on it mm -hmm. and then tried to put my blade on that line. 
I've, I've done it different ways, but how do you get your dimensions out of your lumber? So what I do here is I went ahead and we cut off the top here and then I got these live edge boards. Now I've got these two parallel edges. I'm now left with a cant of an unknown size because right now on the log scale, I don't know where I'm at. Now on my mill, how I have it set up is I always, I have a scale where I always know how high my blade is above the bunk. So I would know just by looking at the scale that, okay, this log right now is six and three quarters tall. Because at some point, I'm gonna wanna cut, I'm gonna have a, a, a waist that's maybe an eighth of an inch or three quarters of an inch. But right now I wanna get one inch boards all the way until I can't. But I also don't wanna eat into that final five and a half inch dimension. Now that I have this though, we are about a half inch off from five and a half, by the way. So I'm gonna basically take a half inch cut. I'm gonna actually flip the log and get it off the other side here. I very well might then, cause I'm gonna be in a, I'm gonna have a five and a half inch cant on the deck. I will go ahead and cut the run out off and then I may cut a couple two by sixes out of this. Mm -hmm. It looks like you can definitely get them. That's how I That's do gonna it. be eight or nine inches, not five. I also have never gotten the hang of maximizing my yield, which is what I'm okay. trying to get from you, is that you didn't necessarily want those one buys, but you know what you want out of this. Yep. So you're going to take the one buys. Correct. To get down to that dimension. Yeah, because I don't want to just... Now, my understanding on softwood, softwood and hardwood are different in terms of the pith. If you notice, many of the 4x4s, 6x6s, and 8x8s, the pith is often centered right in those posts. And that's the reason, the reason for that is because they're using small diameter trees. And on softwoods, you can do that. So on this right here, I'm a little bit off centered. I'm gonna go ahead and flip this and remove the remainder off this side, and it'll keep the pith a little bit more centered in there. So that way, if you think about it, you have all the forces equally around that middle, and this wood will not split. When these dry, they will get vertical cracking, but they won't break apart. What I like about the method that you're using right now is that by getting that to five and a half, then when you slice your two inches off of it, you know what they are. Yep. I kind of take the can the side as big as I can get it, uh -huh. and then my two bys are as wide as I can get them. They're not an exact, they're not two by six. Then you have to process them seven, further. Two by five, two by nine, yep. and I get a variety. Then you're, then you're stuck with stacking them up on the mill, trying to rip off the edge. If you have a straight line rip machine, you could go ahead and cut them off. That's what you do with live edge stuff. So if Paul Case has an edger that okay. he can just do that with, and I, we don't. Yep, so for, for just being a small one-man sawmill operation, this is the way I've efficiently cut a, a lot of material. I built a, I started a tree house for my kids. I built a shed. I built a firewood shed. And we built a significant portion of the deck out of the same exact material. See, that's my reason for having a mill, to do exactly what you're talking about. But I'm stacking lumber down there and I'm looking at my stack and I'm saying some of this is not that usable because yep. it's not the right dimensions. Yep. You have to differentiate. Are you looking for usable material or are you looking for pretty material? There's people that like slabs because they want to do live edge tables and all that. For me, I want to build. That's exactly where I'm at. So what we've done today 
is I brought in a YouTuber with some experience doing different things. Ran a sawmill, ran chainsaws, ran some equipment, and he spent a day running the same kind of stuff in my setup. And so I'm just curious what your thoughts are on this mill and just the tractor and the different equipment you ran today. Absolutely. So the way Brock has this set up with the ends of this building open on both ends, that is awesome because when it's hot, I hate milling because I'm out in broad daylight in the sun in Oklahoma, it's darn hot. Okay, so that's gonna be nice. You probably get a nice breeze out here through it. Also, it's large enough to get some equipment in here. Bring a log in with pallet forks to be able to move around. You can, you can, you have access all around the mill. And what's the capacity on this lengthwise? 16 feet. 16 foot, and then he has a lot more room both directions. Uh, the sawmill works fantastic. That little bomb light, that's impressive. That's the first time I've ever run a stand-up skid steer before. And uh, I've always been nervous about it, but it, it's, it's different. If but, your logs weigh 800 pounds, then that's the machine. Yeah, yeah. That, that for, for someone like me, because I've, I've been thinking about buying a skid steer, but if I can find something like that, it's very useful. Yep. He got to run a John Deere tractor. He's used to Kubota. Do you like the John Deere? <laughs> yeah. Not really? Well, um, you don't have to say you liked it. Well, it, it was just different because you have the diversion valve on there. Also, also I'm used to grapples with the see-through tines top and bottom, so you can kind of see what you're grabbing. So Brock has a full bucket and a grapple on it, which is a cool thing. However, for me, because I'm not familiar with his machine and I'm not a fantastic operator, it was a little difficult. So... Never ran anything like it before, and I, without any instruction, I said, take this John Deere tractor with an added grapple and just go use it. I'll be doing other stuff. <laughs> it, but that's what you do with equipment, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you hop on it and you figure it out. But I tell you what, I, the footage can't be good. <laughs> What'd you think of this? We all, I also showed him the slab rack and we cut some slab. What'd you think of this design here? I need to add this to my setup. Because what I have historically done is I've put a mound of slabs this tall. It's massive. And I just go out there with the saw and start cutting. And you know what? This allows them to be utilized for firewood. What I do oftentimes is I will cut them up in just enough to fit into a burn barrel a lot, a lot of times. And so that's wasteful. So I like this because we use pine for firewood. I actually use it in my home but we use it out at campfires, and this is just a fantastic way of utilizing it and keeping organized. And like Brock was saying, you want to tackle this as you go, because otherwise it becomes a project that you don't want to do because you'll spend all day on it. And uh, you don't only have to say nice things. I, I probably have all kinds of problems, but every once in a while, all the you shoulda people commenting, I should have made this exactly the way I did because it works pretty good. <laughs> I should have done some other things different, but this building and this machine and this Quonset hut, all, a lot of it works. It's real easy to sit there and look at what everyone else has done and say, oh man, it could be done better this way or be done better that way. But let me tell you, when you put yourself on camera and you start editing footage, you realize, man, we know where, where we could have done some stuff better. Mm -hmm. And there's always a better, um, maybe a more efficient way, but this is what this is about. It's about learning and we can, we can all learn from one another. So if you want to learn how to do this without a tractor, go watch the Oakey Woodsman. He, uh, gets into all kinds of the mischief. Yeah. Appreciate you watching. And I'll see you next time.